Hello and welcome to Scanner Today's Last Week in AI podcast, where you can hear us chat about what's going on with AI. As usual, in this episode, we will summarize and discuss some of last week's most interesting AI news. You can also check out our Last Week in AI newsletter at lastweekin.ai for articles we did not cover in this episode. I am one of your hosts, Andrei Kurenkov, back from my trip to Japan. And uh, yeah, in case you don't know, I graduated from Stanford with my PhD focused on AI this year, and now I work at a generative AI startup. And if I can say, it is just nice to be back in the saddle, the two of us doing this again. We've been kind of skirting around. You've been in Japan. I've been flying around San Francisco or whatever it was. And and now we're finally back in the saddle. It's really good to be here doing it like old times. And uh, I'm I'm the voice of Jeremy, by the way. I am actually also Jeremy, but these days you have to just be clear. And um, yeah, so I I do AI safety work uh, with one of the co-founders of Gladstone AI. And we do, yeah, technical AI safety and AI policy work on catastrophic and extreme, extreme risks, if I can say that. Yeah, I agree, Jeremy. I think uh, it's been a weird month or two in our lives that yes. has made the podcast not quite work. But for now, we should be back to normal for any regular listeners. So just Amen. FYI. And before we kick things off, we're going to start things with a an ad for really, I mean, I, I was going to say my, my favorite podcast. Of course, my favorite podcast is the Last Week in AI podcast, but but um, the Super Data Science podcast, co-hosted or sorry, hosted by John Crone, who came on and guest hosted our latest episode before this one and one earlier, uh, is a spectacular podcast. I really, really like, I'd be recommending this uh, whether or not we were doing an ad. Uh, I've been on the podcast before. It's really amazing. John is an extremely gifted interviewer. Um, they cover all kinds of different topics around AI career stuff, but technology stuff. You know, they talk to all kinds of researchers at you know the, the big labs and, and all the things you might expect. Really, really great interviews. Um, John is the chief data scientist and co-founder of a company called Nebula, which is an AI company. He also has a best-selling book called Deep Learning Illustrated, which is just like, it is the right way to explain deep learning. I'm a big fan. Um, yeah. So if you're looking for a, a great podcast on that topic, something more kind of interviewee type than, than what we do, it's, it's not necessarily a news podcast. It's more of a kind of deep dive with individual guests. I, I highly recommend it. They've got over 700 episodes. Uh, they come up twice a week and it's all year round. So there's, there's really something new uh, every time you listen. And again, highly recommend and, and go check it out. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think if you listen to the previous episode, you know that John is pretty knowledgeable about AI. And I think after you do 700 episodes and talk to so many smart people, you learn a lot. So it's it's also a good thing to do in addition to following up with news. And one more thing before we get into it, uh, we haven't done any sort of acknowledgement of listener comments in a bit, so I wanted to quickly do a roundup and mention a few of them. We had a new review on Apple Podcast from I Am Carp. It's always pleasant to see something positive, and uh, this in particular said that we don't go too deep, but we kind of do try to do a lot of breadth, so I think it's nice to see that people do seem to like this sort of mix of just covering a ton of stuff every week, which we do. Uh, So thank you for that. We uh, also had one comment from Jamie uh, and and a couple other people in the past that said that they liked the X-Risk episode. So I think we'll be doing more of that uh, topic-specific stuff in the future. There's also a bit of comments on audio quality. That's not on me, I will say. I I still need to learn proper uh, podcast producing. But let's just say, if you do find issues with audio quality and you have any suggestions, feel free to get in touch. Because, like, you know, I've got a mic and I honestly don't know what I'm doing. So, if you know, if you find there's like a difference between the two audio qualities, like, please flag that. (laughs) That means I gotta, yeah. That would actually be good feedback. If you have any specifics, uh, you can email contact at lastweekin.ai. And uh, I guess one more quick one. We had a comment uh, on episode 137 from Roberto that just asked, why do we never talk about Intel's devices? And uh, it's it's a good point. Uh, I would say probably it just doesn't come up in news a lot or hasn't been. Although we will actually be talking about it this episode. So uh, maybe something, yeah, we are not 
too aware of in the AI space. Yeah, I mean, so Intel, um, when, like when you look at the companies that are leading on chip chip fabrication, especially like Intel wants to be one of them, but they're not really there. Um, you know, you you look at the TSMCs, Samsung also an important player, but but you start to things drop off really quickly as as you go beyond that. Um, Intel's been making some cool plays. Like they are one to watch for sure, and that is something that you know I I, I kind of sleep with one eye open. I would say on Intel, uh, scan things every once in a while. But um, you're right, the big headlines do tend to be you know it's all about that five nanometer chip, the H100. Where's the node size going next to TSMC? And for better or for worse, that's that's kind of the world. Right. Yeah. Ninety five percent of the time we talk about Nvidia, but in this episode we'll actually be talking about both Intel and AMD. So you might find it Yay. interesting. And in general, there's going to be just a ton of stuff in this episode. There's been, I guess, a lot of news. So we are just going to dive in and we're going to go pretty quick. So try and keep up, I guess. <laughs> Time to take a deep breath. <gasps> yeah. All right. Kicking off with tools and apps, we have the story ChatGPT goes multimodal, now supports voice and image uploads. So this is kind of a big deal, I would say. Uh, as the story says, First, you can now talk to ChatGPT. So you can, in their apps, click a little button, say something out loud, and then ChatGPT responds to you with a synthetic voice. So it's basically using ChatGPT as usual, but instead of typing your inputs, you are saying them, and ChatGPT reads its uh, responses back. So that's one. And then two, Based on GPT-4, you can now upload images and talk to ChatGPT about those images. So if you can, for instance, like, you know, I don't know, upload an image of some food and ask it, what is this food? And it will answer that question. Uh, and uh, that is available on the web and on mobile. So pretty big upgrades to ChatGPT, I would say. Yeah, and huge for the actual like day-to-day -day use case. You know, if you can talk to Chat GPT, that is so different objectively from having to type into it. So I would expect like a whole bunch of new discovered use cases coming out of this. Um, a couple of interesting notes on the tech here, the back end, because it's not necessarily entirely what I would have expected at least. Um, OpenAI famously has this open source model called Whisper, which is a a speech to text model. And what we're learning here is that apparently um, the features that, that have just been rolled out have been powered by their proprietary speech recognition synthesis and vision model. So, you know, it's probably not just vanilla whisper in the back end. There's probably, you know, whisper plus or, or some, some extra souped up model, which is, you know, slightly interesting. Um, but I think the, the most interesting thing about this is the way it's set up. It is a Frankenstein monster, it seems, of a bunch of different models glued together. So it's not like it's an end-to-end -end trained multimodal thing. It's not one model that you know, takes in your text and your image and spits out whatever. Um, it really is this kind of software engineering behemoth. And I would imagine that was a massive, massive engineering challenge, a lot of impressive pipelines. Uh, it kind of makes you think like, you know, what is the the big compute bottleneck where all the costs going to come from? You know, probably it's going to be the the language model in the middle, like GPT four, or whatever they're using. Um, but but just with so many models in the mix, like your your costs per uh, per query really go up really fast. And um, and last thing I I just note on this is they are taking measures to prevent misuse of the voice synthesis capabilities that come with this, which you know obviously you can use for fraud. We've covered a whole bunch of stories about that happening with other models. And um, so they're being very careful about who they allow to use that technology. They've got only certain approved partnerships that can leverage that. And that does happen to include Spotify where you can, you know, where podcasters can transcribe their content uh, into different languages while retaining their original voice. So if you want to hear us speak in Mandarin or in Russian uh, and you're listening on uh, Spotify, I don't know, maybe you can do that. Kind of kind of cool. Exactly. Yeah. So lots to note of this. And I think I'll just build up a little on one of your points. I think we, we kind of key new component of this, so to speak, is the voice synthesis part. To my knowledge, OpenAI has never really done anything with voice synthesis. They have, have done music synthesis uh, quite a few times, but uh, here the kind of generation of an AI voice from text is, as you said, I think not being done by them even. It's being done by a partner with a few kind of professional voice actors powering it. And as you might imagine, uh, I don't think 
you'll play a clip, but if you go to the link for this news article, you can actually listen to the conversation and it's very high quality. It doesn't sound like a robot. I mean, it sounds a little bit synthetic, but it, it sounds nice. And so you can actually imagine having this conversation if you are okay waiting for one second for it to respond whenever you you know ask something. And that's really the big thing. Eh? Sorry, just a quick note that that inspired, like the latency piece. Latency is so much more important with voice. Like you see people, you know, when you type a prompt into chat GPT, you can forgive it for having to write things out because we're used to humans taking time to write things. But there's something more awkward about the latency when it's voice, right? You just like ask it a question, what's your favorite color? And then it takes five seconds, you get a response. I think that's actually going to be a really powerful forcing function for improvements in engineering and, and reducing latency. And on to the next story, also on ChatGPT, ChatGPT can now search the web in real time. That's pretty much the story. There's now this feature called Browse with Bing that is available to Plus and Enterprise subscribers that is similar to what you already have in Bing Chat and Google's Bard. Basically, when you respond, uh, when you ask something, it can then make a search query to generate a response. So now its knowledge will not be limited up to 2021. It can actually you know, find sources to base its reply on, which is kind of a big deal uh, in terms of the capabilities that provides. And uh, I guess given that this is already in Bing and Bard, now it's also in ChatGPT and you can use it there. Yeah, you can really feel the pressure on these companies to to catch up with each other when they do stuff like this. You know, I, I think very noteworthy. This is not the first time, of course, that uh, OpenAI has brought uh, internet browsing to ChatGPT. Right, we had this back in May, and um, it was disabled. Right, because some users were finding ways to use it to get around paywalls and things like that, which sort of forced OpenAI to shut it all down. So this implies OpenAI thinks at least they've gotten around this. And um, uh, yeah, they've got a bunch of updates associated with this, one of which, and I think this is really interesting in the context of some of the copyright lawsuits that we've seen, um, they're now going to force the chatbot to follow the instructions in robots.txt files on websites. These are the files that tell you what bots are allowed to do with your website. You know, so if you go to cnn.com slash robots.txt, you'll see a bunch of bots that are allowed to browse the website and which subdomains they're allowed to use and so on. So this is basically making, um, uh, making this chatbot kind of follow that uh, follow that uh, set of instructions, which is important if you're going to claim, you know, look, we're allowed to use this data for copyright purposes and so on. So kind of an interesting little little nugget there. Um, they're back. Yeah, and I would say this, I could easily see myself benefiting a lot from this. It's, uh, I would say, yes, it's a big deal. So for instance, you know, maybe I want to have an update on the state of the Ukraine war or any ongoing, you know, big story. Uh, now, Presumably with this, I can ask ChatGPT, you know, go look up the recent events in the last few months and give me the highlights, something that usually like you can't find a single article that highlights like this is what's been happening in the last four months, five months. It's actually quite hard to, you know, be updated if you haven't been just keeping up with it. So there is a lot of potential use cases and I think this is very cool to have. And next we have Meet the AI Jane Austen. Meta weaves AI through its apps. And so this is a, a whole family, a cluster of different apps that are now going to be AI enabled, a bunch of AI enabled features that Meta announced recently. And it really is a giant cluster. So uh, they're calling this um, Meta AI, which is a bit confusing because that's also what their like research arm is. Um, and they've got this advanced conversational assistant. It'll be available on WhatsApp, Messenger, Instagram, and guess what? It's coming to Ray-Ban Meta Smart Glasses, which I know everyone listening to this uses, and Quest 3, which I also know everyone listening to this uses. Um, Meta can give you a bunch of real-time information and generate photorealistic images from your text prompts in seconds to share with friends, they say. It is available in the US only. Um, but one of the interesting features of this is so so they're rolling this out you know 28 different or sorry 29 i think in total different ai personalities um, they're based on cultural icons you've got one inspired by snoop dogg another by tom brady kendall Jemmer, jenner and naomi osaka and so on and so forth so it's really like this kind of um, deep cultural play uh, with ai conversational agents and weirdly 
Um, this is part of a partnership with Microsoft, which kind of slightly blew my mind. Um, there's not a ton of information about the specific nature of that partnership, uh, other than the fact that it goes through Bing. Um, so there's Bing enablement to the, the search queries that these chatbots can run to provide you with fresh information. But I'm, I'm really fascinated by that. You know, Obviously, Microsoft wants to position its Bing search like relative to Google search. And so that's obviously going to be part, part of this. But um, strategically, for Facebook to start to lean on that um, seems like it introduces a pretty fundamental uh, vulnerability in the meta stack because like search is such a becoming such an important feature of keeping chatbots up to date. So I'm kind of curious if that's going to emerge as a kind of uh, a, a chronic issue for meta that they keep having to lean on external like third party services that they don't own to power search, whereas you know, Microsoft and, and Google don't. But uh, anyway, I thought it was a, a really interesting and certainly a very big announcement. Yeah, exactly. It was just a whole host of them. So even in addition to those things of having an assistant, you also have a bunch of stuff with image generation. You can create stickers and emojis with text prompts. I think you can also uh, edit your images with various ways with backdrop and restyle. So it was just a slew of announcement. And even as you said, there was the uh, Ray-Ban AI smart glasses, which actually <laughs> happened to buy the first generation of them for my Japan trip. Oh, and no it's actually kind of like subtly an interesting story in the sense that, you know, these things, you wear them and they have little speakers and, you know, uh, microphones and so the idea to me is, is actually kind of cool that you get to this her future where you have this on your head and you can talk to it anytime about pulling out your phone and now we have this digital assistant right that you as you said is built into all the apps whatsapp facebook instagram this is like three billion users globally across all of this so kind of hard to understate how it Big yeah. deal this seems to be. Uh, just to pick out one example, last week you talked about character.ai, which is a fast growing startup that offers the capability to basically talk with different characters, just kind of chat. And they are kind of, yeah, pretty big. Like if you look at the statistics of how many people use them and the uh, especially the retention of like the average session time on character that AI is like 30 minutes. It's like crazy for any product like this. And now Meta is basically introducing the same idea in all these apps that people already use, whether you're like younger and use Instagram or older and use Facebook or you use WhatsApp to keep in touch with your family, right? It's now everywhere. So maybe character AI is kind of like out of luck now. I don't know. But uh, yeah, really big set of stories here. Yeah. And it is also mirroring the moves that Microsoft made right with Microsoft Copilot. Like again, we have an AI assistant that's integrated in all the product offerings of this giant company. Google has the same, like kind of becoming the norm. Like every company just has this like immersive AI that follows you everywhere. That sounds not at all like a Black Mirror episode. No. <laughs> And one extra note on this, there was uh, additional news stories that uh, covered that these new offerings were trained on a public uh, Facebook and Instagram posts. So uh, Meta did specify that they include any public, so nothing you sent in messages to friends, nothing you shared with just your friends on Facebook, anything that the privacy is set to public so anyone can see it they did use that to train their models for this and also things like Llama 2, uh, which I think is unsurprising and I would even maybe think to say not bad, but is something to, I guess, be aware of that this is just an assumption you should make now that whatever you put in and you don't set to be private is going to be used to train some AI probably. And it is interesting to see that increased focus from the superscalers, from the AI, the, the AI model developers on this question, because you know it's coming. You, you just you know there's going to be some kind of copyright law. This cannot be allowed to continue unregulated, and you know they're they're positioning for it. And this seems like a it's an interesting position to take. It and it like you said, it doesn't sound insane at all. And moving on to the lightning round. First story is Windows 11's next big update is now available with Copilot, AI-powered paint, and more. 
so we just mentioned Copilot and how Microsoft is integrating AI into its various features. And yeah, now it's released and you now have Windows Copilot, which is this digital assistant that's built into Windows that so can answer questions and can, you know, fix your settings better. <laughs> but also there are AI powered updates to paint, snipping tools and photos with things like transparency and layers and paint and text extraction and reduction and snipping. So yeah, just a bunch of AI stuff that's now going to be built into the stuff you get with Windows. And next, Adobe launches Photoshop's web version with Firefly-powered AI tools. We've talked about Firefly uh, before on the podcast, actually a couple times. Um, now it's officially, Adobe is officially launching uh, Photoshop for the web. So now it's available for all users with paid plans. And um, the, yeah, the web version already includes a bunch of Firefly-powered AI tools. Um, there's generative fill, there's generative expand. So you can collaborate on files, you can share links. Like even if the other person doesn't have the subscription, you can do this. So kind of interesting as well from a, a business model standpoint. You know, there's a cost, obviously, to generating images, especially high quality ones of the sort that you'd expect uh, to be going on here. And so they're obviously willing to, to pay that even if the other person doesn't have a subscription to help with shareability. Um, so yeah, sort of an interesting additional development, kind of in the same vein as uh, the Microsoft announcement from earlier. Yeah, a little bit. And uh, I, we have covered Firefly before. I think from a professional standpoint, if you want to do image generation as part of your workflow, Photoshop seems like the right way to go to me. And now, you know, there's even more of a reason with this announcement. Next, we have YouTube unveils a suite of AI powered tools for video creators. So there was an event called Made on YouTube and they announced these tools, including AI instance, uh, AI insights, which will use generative AI to create video ideas and draft outlines. There's also a dream screen that is pretty much like a green screen, <laughs> but with AI and yeah, kind of a variety of features for editing and creation that are just now built in for free for anyone who makes stuff on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, zooming out a little bit, this is like an interesting bit of algorithm creep, right? Like we're used to humans make the videos, write the scripts and all that, and then the algorithm kind of selects which ones to bump, and then humans have to reverse engineer the algorithm to figure out what would really land. Now the algorithm, or a separate algorithm, but a related one, is going to help us with scripting the, the uh, content as well. You can kind of see in the limit how this becomes like custom content for individual users even as compute gets cheaper. Um, so this is a, it's a really interesting shift. And uh, I, I think it's actually surprisingly fundamental. It, it's, a, it's a big step in the direction of like custom feeds for everyone where not only the ordering of the content is customized to you, but also the content itself. And this is now a kind of an intermediate step along that journey. Oh, yeah. I think it'll take maybe one or two years before we get some of these YouTube genres like reaction videos to just be fully AI. You know, you don't even need to do it because it's so kind of straightforward. You can just generate it. So that's probably coming, but not here for now. And next up, we have Google is opening up its generative AI search experience to teenagers. Yeah, that's the, that's the fun end of that sentence. Uh, Google is opening up its um, SGE, its uh, generative search experience to teenagers. This is ages 13 to 17. Um, and there's a conversational mode now where you can just ask questions, sort of chat GPT style conversational, uh, conversationally. And Google sa says, as you might expect for rollout like this, especially that they have implemented safeguards uh, to prevent inappropriate or harmful content from surfacing. Um, but it, it does raise you know, a lot of interesting questions, especially given what we know about AI jailbreaking um, and, uh, and how these things could actually end up interacting with, uh, with users, even if they're not jailbroken, but just you know, an, an out of distribution input, a surprising input comes in that the system wasn't trained to handle well, you know, the, the stakes are, are pretty high here. So uh, kind of interesting to see where this goes. Again, I think this is a pretty big precedent setting move. I wonder if there's a certain measure of legal risk that's being taken on here as well. A lot of the companies that are forging ahead in the space, implicitly, that's part of the cost, right? You're trying new things with generative AI. You don't have control over the model itself. You can't predict what it will say. And um, as a result, you know, that's, <laughs> you're, you're exposed to a lot, more, uh, a lot more legal risk than you otherwise would. 
Yeah, I didn't even think about it. Like, I assumed that teenagers could do this, right? But uh, yeah, interestingly, they they did not. So I guess Google is becoming more confident in oh, the Andre, safety. Teenagers can't they can't spell chat.openai.com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And moving into our next section, applications and business. First story is AI startup Lamini bets future on AMD's Instinct GPU. So this is our big AMD story. And this was a pretty big story, I think. Uh, so there was an announcement by the startup Lamini. This startup uh, helps enterprises build and run generative AI products with fine-tuning of existing foundation models against some data set. So, you know, you can take Llama 2 and you customize it to your needs and you run it on Lamini's uh, infrastructure. And the story here is Lamini then announced that internally in the back end, they have been using these AMD GPUs for a while. And there was kind of this justification or explanation that as we've been discussing, NVIDIA chips have been hard to get, NVIDIA GPUs. And it seems like uh, Lamini has really bet on these AMD Instinct, uh, in this case, MI. Uh, 250x GPUs, and it says that this could be scaled up to thousands of these things. So yeah, it, it's really just positioning this AMD GPU suite as a possible alternative that it allows people to use if you can't get NVIDIA type stuff. Yeah, and, and this is actually, I mean, it's all part of the, the demand question, right? In, in the space, everybody's just trying to get their hands on as many H100s as they possibly can. And there's a story we'll talk about later that I think will really kind of make this point. H100s are worth more than money at this point. Like you can have a ton of money and no H100s and you're screwed. It's a supply issue. Um, AMD is a very interesting company, by the way. Like they are really the only or one of very, very few companies along with you know, maybe Intel, IBM, Apple, and, and ARM actually as well. But it's a very small group of companies that have ever designed really good GPUs and taken them to market. And, um, and they're doing the same here with, with GPUs. This is, I, I got to look into the MI250X more closely because I'm just looking at some of the specs and it, it on the surface, it looks really impressive. So it's cheaper, or at least the list price that's estimated here is about 15K relative to the H100's 20K. And it can apparently um, deliver, I'm, I'm just looking at some of the specs here, uh, let's say at, at 16 floating points, which is closer to what you might use for, for AI um, training and inference. Uh, yeah, 360, so about the, I can't believe this is the claim is like three times more um, compute than uh, yeah than an H100. I'm going to dig into that actually for next episode because that seems pretty wild to me. And uh, if true, very, very big deal. But um, anyway, bottom line is AMD seems to have some really impressive hardware as on the GPU side. And as you might expect, the demand super, super high. Exactly. So this the story that this startup has been working with more than 100 of these GPUs in production for a year kind of is basically saying we've already been using it and it already is providing good results as you have been used to with NVIDIA. And I think this is a smart play because the reason people use NVIDIA is kind of they know it and the kind of ecosystem around it is very mature. So CUDA and PyTorch and all these things have been developed for a long time, as we've discussed. And so AMD is probably catching up in many respects on this. And so having Lamini as a sort of front end such that you don't need to worry about what chip you're using really, like... If Lamini can figure out how to get these to work as well as NVIDIA GPUs, then uh, you know they can do it for you and then uh, you don't need to worry about it and you can just have access to compute that you will not have otherwise. So yeah, pretty notable story and I guess it'll be interesting to see where this goes with AMD uh, next. 
And next we have Amazon to invest up to $4 billion in AI startup Anthropic. And boy, is this a story that is just the tip of a really big iceberg. So yes, on the surface of it, the story is Amazon's going to invest up to $4 billion in Anthropic. The minute you start to kind of peel back the layers of the onion, though, there's a really interesting story that, that starts to come into focus. So there's a broader collaboration that both these companies are trying to tee up. And it helps to get a little bit of context on each uh, Amazon obviously is a super scaler, um, but uh, in terms of, of cloud compute and, and even compute for AI, though they are now struggling a bit on the AI hardware side. Um, they're getting really poor allocations from NVIDIA, well below their current cloud market share. So if, the, if current trends continue, Amazon is going to start losing out on the AI hardware war. And so they have a very strong incentive to find a partner they can collaborate with to learn from, to, you know, to, to iterate on uh, hardware specs on with. And that really seems like it's Anthropic. Anthropic, on the flip side, is really keen to have a scaled provider of AI op uh, optimized compute, right? And that is Amazon here. Anthropic has eyes on hitting AGI. They expect that they need about a billion dollars over the next 18 months or so to develop Claude Next, which is going to be kind of the next generation model. Uh, they expect it to require about 10 times more processing power than GPT-4. So for context, uh, GPT-4 was trained, it's estimated, on about 10 to the 12 tera ops. Um, we're expecting this Claude Next thing to be 10 to the 13 tera ops, or that's like a 10 with 25 zeros after it, operations uh, that uh, that go into the training process for these models. So huge, huge expenses. Um, this is uh, So this is a, a really big deal. It's part of that integrated kind of partnership model that we have seen. You know, obviously we've seen DeepMind get acquired and then full on absorbed by Google because you need a good model developer coupled with a massive scale hardware provider. We saw OpenAI and Microsoft collaborate in the same way. You know, Microsoft not quite acquiring, but almost acquiring OpenAI, having a lot of ownership over their, uh, their technology. We're seeing something here, it seems, similarly shaping up between AWS or Amazon more broadly and Anthropic, which positions Anthropic as kind of a legit OpenAI tiered player in this race. You know, we've talked on a podcast a lot about at least my skepticism about uh, whether people, whether companies that operate at lower levels of scale that don't have billions of dollars and in massive infrastructure to draw on are even remotely competitive in this age of AI scaling. Um, I think this kind of rockets Anthropic to truly kind of first rate status along with those other uh, organizations. It is also interesting that apparently Amazon is only taking a minority stake in Anthropic. They're very careful to say that. Uh, the corporate governance structure remains unchanged. Anthropic has this long-term benefit trust thing that they've got. It's essentially, it's designed to guide them uh, to follow their responsible scaling policy because they're very AI safety focused. They want to make sure that doesn't change. It seems that's not going to change here. But you know, when we talk about a minority stake, Hey, that could be 49%. That could be a lot of leverage, like we saw with the OpenAI Microsoft uh, partnership. So there's a, a lot, a lot going on here. Um, you know, I, I think it, it makes a lot of sense for both parties. I will add, there is one more thing uh, to the story. As of today, the information was reporting Anthropic is holding talks with investors, including Google, about an additional two billion dollar funding round. So we're we're looking at like maybe not. Uh, Amazon and uh, Anthropic being the only partnership that matters here. Google, that's already invested in Anthropic, may be double dipping now. And the valuations we're looking at here seem to be anywhere from 20 to 30 billion, at least according to these uh, these rumors at the moment. Yeah. So big story, as you said, with lots of kind of implications under the surface. Uh, a lot of this was covered in a blog post by Anthropic titled, Expanding Access to Save Her AI with Amazon. And that's kind of the other part of this I will point out is there's an expansion of support of Amazon Bedrock. So that's kind of the Amazon route towards using their Claude models. Uh, like OpenAI, uh, Anthropic has an API where you can build on top of Claude for whatever application you want. But unlike OpenAI, you can also access Claude through Amazon Bedrock. And now you can also do uh, model customization and fine tuning, which is something that is, yeah, not provided otherwise on Amazon. And yeah, is, is kind of a big deal, I would say, because uh, it hasn't been 
too easy to get access to Claude so far for yeah. quite a while. And uh, many people already build on top of Amazon, on top of AWS. So there is quite a bit of benefit potentially to building with Amazon Bedrock instead of you know just a new API provider like uh, Chat, uh, like OpenAI or like Anthropic. So that's another kind of significant aspect of the story. That's a really good point. Yeah, Amazon becomes this sort of like glorified distribution channel as well for Anthropic and their models, and that actually I think positions. I don't know. I, I could see it positioning Anthropic more weakly relative to Amazon than OpenAI's position position relative to Microsoft. Because we th we think back to there, you know, OpenAI has independent distribution of ChatGPT. Like people go to this is the second time I'm saying that on the podcast. People go to chat.openai.com to use that service, and they know it as an OpenAI service. Whereas you know, Anthropic's Claude is is you know a little bit more more closed off. There's less wide distribution. There isn't a killer app like ChatGPT associated with it. And so you know, the when you don't own the distribution, you do have a lot less leverage in the relationship. Who knows? Maybe that's part of why they're also courting Google and try to kind of play it both ways here. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how this all shakes out once we see the the equity numbers on the cap table. Right. Yeah. And uh, to that point, it's. Interesting to me also that Amazon, as we discussed in the past, has also partnered with Hugging Face and invested a lot in Hugging Face, also with this concept of kind of being a distributor of models, where Hugging Face is this repository and Amazon provides these models that aren't internally developed, right? So they're kind of a distributor, a way to host and run models rather than a source of models. So this seems to be kind of a general strategy that they're taking on and maybe yeah. maybe a pretty good bet. And next, we're going to kick off our lightning round and we'll start it with China to challenge ASML with better technology than EUV. And there's like some really quick explanation we've got to do about the words in that title. Um, so first off, there are two techniques that we can use to make cutting edge chips to basically like laser in, if you will, the, um, the features that we need to laser in in order to make cutting edge chips at tiny, tiny scales. Um, if you want to laser features that are like five or three nanometers in size, which you need to make things like the NVIDIA H100, the cutting edge chips right now, you have to use something called extreme ultraviolet light. That is your only real option at the moment. And the only company on planet Earth that really does extreme ultraviolet uh, lithography or that, that makes machines that can do extreme ultraviolet lithography is ASML. It's this Dutch company. And there's been an export control, a ban on ASML exporting those extreme UV lithography machines to China. So now you can see why China might want to come up with some other alternative to this. Uh, now, this title is overhyped to some degree. It's not about an imminent new capability. It's about a promising research trajectory that got a lot of attention since Huawei made their shock announcement that showed that actually it seems like China has made a domestic breakthrough at the seven nanometer node size. So not quite cutting, cutting edge, not five or three nanometers, but at seven nanometers, they're there. And that definitely was not expected. Um, that's shown a bright light on the Chinese domestic uh, lithography and semiconductor manufacturing market and capabilities. And this uh, line of effort, this this kind of uh, research trajectory has to do with saying, okay, you know, this Dutch company ASML, their lithography machines, they got a whole bunch of uh, a bunch of problems, and maybe we can make something better and leapfrog them completely. So we don't even have to care about the export controls over these machines. We can make a domestic device that does just as well or even better. And the strategy they're going to use is basically making a particle accelerator, this like giant structure, because it turns out the charged particles, when you accelerate them, they radiate light. They radiate, they can radiate very high frequency light, such as extreme UV light. And for various technical reasons, this actually turns out to be a better light source. And so there's a prospect that you could see you know, this line of research culminating in something that can compete with ASML. Theoretically, if it gets pushed to where it could go, um, the speculation is they could get all the way down to two nanometer node sizes. So in other words, you know, skip way ahead to essentially the like more than the cutting edge we have today, better than the three nanometer nodes that TSNC even makes. This is all speculative. Uh, it's a research trajectory. Um, it's just interesting and I think noteworthy to see how this Huawei story has 
like kind of accelerated or, or at least drawn attention to the Chinese domestic lithography ecosystem and, and kind of revived interest and excitement in it. Yeah, so this is not quite, I guess, business yet, but I think the implication is uh, that if this comes through, then this competitive edge and kind of monopoly almost will be gone, and this will have huge, huge you know, ramifications for the economies of these countries and so on. Yeah, and, and there are startups actually like in China that are trying to push in this direction. So, you know, if we had to call wedge that in there to call it a business story, technically it kind of is, but you're you're absolutely right. It, it is more speculative. Next story is Intel says newest laptop chips and software will handle generative AI. So Intel is releasing a new chip in December that will allow these Gen AI chatbots to run on laptops without relying on cloud data centers. So basically, it seems like without using the internet. Uh, so this chip called Meteor Lake and the software tools will yeah, allow you to run Gen AI locally. Uh, this was demonstrated at, at a conference uh, and made sure that you could generate songs and answer questions in a conversational style while disconnected from the internet. And on top of that, there was also news that Intel is on track to deliver a successor chip called Arrow Lake next year and aims to rival TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, in manufacturing technology. So... There's your Intel a chip story. Uh, it seems like you know they are angling a little bit different to this sort of uh, local edge kind of uh, inference device, uh, but not so much on the sort of infrastructure for the development of AI, which is what Nvidia does with GPUs and AMD, as we just covered. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we'll expect NVIDIA to, to really focus on that direction soon as well. Um, but at the end of the day, when it comes to these chips, the proof is in the pudding, right? Like the the, the appropriate question to, to ask is, okay, but can I see the chip? Like, can, can I run the tests on the chip? Um, you know, it, it's uh, de demos are, are notoriously um, tricky to use to evaluate these systems. And uh, just generally, you want a good, thorough, robust evaluation with benchmarking and all that against, you know, a comparable... Uh, uh, chip or competing chip. And uh, so I think we'll, we'll really just be in suspense until December when we actually see the, the kind of work product that comes out of all this. Um, but certainly it makes sense for Intel to be positioning for this. And um, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be surprised if they really do start to make some progress. They have made this a major focus, kind of pivoting the whole company in this direction and, and betting the farm, so to speak. So yeah, we'll, we'll see if it pays off. And I, I think it'll be a really impressive uh, engineering achievement if they do. Yeah, and uh, one other interesting thing I see here is that the CEO of the company said that Microsoft's uh, Copilot AI assistant will be able to run on these Intel-based PCs. So in a way, it's kind of like, okay, the AI is built into your operating system, and now it's further built into the hardware of you know your laptop, so you don't need the internet anymore. It's all kind of built in. So that's kind of pretty crazy to think about. It's like at the hardware level, at the OS layer, uh, everything. So that's kind of cool. Uh, next, we have Getty made an AI generator that only trained on its licensed images. And so this is a partnership that Getty's set up with NVIDIA. Uh, to launch a thing they're calling Generative AI by Getty Images. And yeah, it's, it's using Getty's it's like giant library of licensed tools. Getty, of course, is this um, uh, provider of, of usually like kind of news, uh, news aggregation and, uh, and related data. Um, the, so apparently, AI model was just only trained on the Getty image library. And so this is kind of reminiscent of the, of the um, uh, Firefly, uh, the, the Photoshop, the, the Adobe Firefly products that we've talked about before, where they've kind of taken a similar play and they said, look, we're only going to train our models on our own proprietary data, thereby um, allowing us to offer our users full copyright indemnification. In other words, if you get sued as a user for supposedly you know, using somebody else's work product, you say, well, wait, wait a minute. Um, I used this model that I was told was trained only on the data that 
that belong to the company that trained the model. So there's no risk of copyright uh, infringement, and Getty is committing then to help defend you if that happens. That's what indemnification means in this context. Um, so you know, another interesting play, very similar to Adobe Firefly. Uh, interesting to see that kind of starting to take shape, maybe as a kind of market norm. I think we'll have to wait for tools like Dolly 3 or Dolly 4, let's say, to uh, to do the same before we can say that. But certainly this seems like a kind of market moat where companies are really like leaning into, okay, the, the data is where the, the value is really, the copyrights are. And that's implicitly a bet on the future of AI regulation and copyright law, which has yet to play out. Uh, but yeah, really interesting strategic move. Definitely. And it's interesting to me that I guess the primary competitor of Getty Images is actually Shutterstock, another provider of stock images of various kinds. And uh, Shutterstock uh, already has text to image for a long time, since January. And that's because they built their text to image stuff on top of OpenAI's Delhi. So they didn't wait around to train a new model that's not trained on anything uh, that's copyrighted. They just build on top of OpenAI's seemingly, you know, copyright questionable stuff. So uh, it's interesting to see that comparison. And uh, yeah, if you look back, you know, many months uh, when Shutterstock announced this, you can see that the main competitor, Getty Images then said it wouldn't be doing that anytime soon and banned AI-generated images. So kind of a, a more conservative approach that may or may not prove to be smart. Next, AI startup writer pens 100 million round. So SF-based uh, AI startup writer has ra raised this 100 million and is now valued at 500 million. As the name of the company implies, their products help businesses generate writing and content across various departments. So it presumably is growing pretty fast. It doesn't seem too unique, but this is a pretty significant raise. So I guess uh, the investors are optimistic. Next, we have AI chip startup Kneron, Neron, there's a K in there, K-N-E-R-O-N, -E secures $49 million investment. Um, so this is a company that's building um, AI chips for connected devices. So sort of like um, end, end device type applications. And uh, they're based in San Diego. Their whole thing is their chips go into things like smart cars and robots and other you know, connected devices that have AI features. And um, they're, they're specifically optimized for inference. So these are not you know, chips that train models. They're about just generating predictions from already trained models. And that's an interesting niche, very important for edge devices, just because you don't tend to do training at the edge for exactly this reason, right? Like edge devices tend to be small. You can't fit really powerful chips on them. And for that reason, you should not expect their chips to be super, super powerful. They are more... They, it's, they have to be more efficient. You want to get, you know, squeeze out more compute per gram, let's say, of, of mass or per unit volume. And so they're saying that their, their new chip can perform up to 4 trillion data operations per second. Again, you know, by, by contrast, you look at the NVIDIA H100, and rather than 4 trillion, you're looking at like about 100 trillion or so, uh, at least at, at 16 floating points. And so this is like, you know, much, much weaker on paper than the H100, but that's because it's trying to do something very different. It's trying to do inference on edge devices. So kind of interesting to see the hardware really starting to adapt to the use case, right? We're seeing more and more custom hardware for custom use cases, even custom model types starting to emerge. So, so an interesting, uh, interesting little story and fundraise here. For sure. And uh, a bit connected to the Intel story, I think, and that this is mm, kind yeah. of the same same kind of thing of if you're not connected to the internet and you cannot ask OpenAI and their servers to do a stuff for you, maybe you need other hardware. And that's an opportunity that it seems like a few players are angling at. And then yet another story of mega fundings, uh, and our last one, is AI startup AlphaSense valued at $2.5 billion after latest funding round. And that latest funding round was $150 million. 
This company helps its customers extract relevant information from public and private content, such as equity research, earnings, uh, company filings, the news. So it's not a foundational company, uh, a foundation model company like OpenAI or Anthropic. They're kind of more application dependent, but it seems like you know, given the rise of AI, there's a lot of optimism about this being a very lucrative type of business. So huge round, and uh, I guess we have they might want to train their own AI models. I don't know, but uh, impressive. Well, that, that is, yeah, that is, that is the interesting question, right? That starts to starts to come to mind when you look at these sorts of fundraises, when you look at the the valuations and the position of a company like this in the market. You know, there's an open question as to whether companies like this face a completely existential threat from the super scale, uh, the super scalers that build the language models that power a lot of their activities in the back end. You know, sure they have access to a lot of interesting data, but at what point does that? You know, what, what's the trade-off between data and compute essentially, and and kind of model? model development competency. And I think those are the two poles that are going to start to define moats in the future. So if AlphaSense has a good enough uh, data chokehold, if they're getting proprietary access or proprietary data, if there's actual secret sauce there, much more defensible. But you can imagine a world where you know it, it, you, you take a good enough Bing chatbot with, with API and web access, and you can start to do stuff if the context window is big enough, if it's able to you know query things. Um, eventually, you know, interesting things can happen, and you can generate charts, even an analysis. So we'll um, we'll have to see where all this goes. I think it's an interesting bet on the relative value of data over essentially data over compute in a way, or data over a model development know how. And on to a few stories not related to funding. First, we have a Silicon Valley supergroup is coming together to create an AI device. This is a very broad story without much detail. Basically, there was some news that OpenAI and Johnny Ive. Yeah, Johnny the, Ive, yeah. Johnny Ive, the designer that's often noted for working on the iPhone. And uh, yeah, there's this kind of uh, hypothetical early stage idea of them partnering and getting funding from SoftBank to develop this hardware device. Very broad strokes, so not much to talk about here. But you know, OpenAI might be thinking of going to hardware, which I guess is interesting. Yeah, it's it's funny. You're like it's a very early stage speculative idea, and then the article says um, they're searching for one billion dollars in funding from SoftBank. I guess that's just where we're at today in the AI world. Like very very early and preliminary. I mean, in fairness, Johnny Ive is this absolute legend in uh, Silicon Valley and specifically in in kind of hardware design. Um, he, there's I think oh god I forget the name of the book. There's like a famous uh, book. I'm pretty sure written about him and, and his journey with um, uh, with Steve Jobs and, and their relationship. Anyway, he's like he is a thing in the valley. And um, uh, anyway, so it'll be interesting to see where this goes. It also was framed as kind of a spinoff. Uh, so so maybe you know maybe they're looking at, at like setting up another company with a clean cap table somehow, or with OpenAI owning just a, a part of that cap table. It's sort of unclear, but yeah, cool uh, cool development and some heavy hitters. Next, we have Microsoft Cloud hiring to, quote, implement global small modular reactor and micro reactor strategy to power data centers. And this is actually really interesting. So what you'll often find um, every time there is a big uh, data center build that that, uh, Microsoft or Google or whoever will plan, it will be coupled with some commitment to um, you know, um, buy green credits or something like that um, to, to offset their carbon emissions. And that's because uh, data center builds are very, very political. The power consumption they require is so high that they end up actually having a very significant effect on the local electrical grid. And so they need to have an argument to make to kind of, you know, to you know, not grease the palms, but at least like kind of make it politically palatable for people to, to get on board. And so Microsoft, one of the things they're looking at here, um, you know, energy becomes really important, obviously, like they need an energy strategy and the small modular reactor, SMR as they're called, um, seems like a really interesting direction for them to, uh, to push into. You know, small modular reactors are kind of what they sound like. They're like a nuclear power plant, but just like compressed, you know, really small that you can have kind of 
off grid to an extent to power your own data centers. And um, they've you know come out and purchased, sorry, Microsoft that is, came out and purchased some clean energy credits from Ontario Power Generation. Ontario being actually the province that I'm in right now in Canada. Um, and uh, we have a bunch of nuclear reactors here and sort of that, that's part of why I guess this would be a natural place. Um, but yeah, so this is interesting. It's it's a, another um, another piece of or another example of this issue where companies can't really hide their big picture strategy when it comes to recruitment. All that often, they got to put up the job postings. They got to tell you what they're looking for. So this kind of gives away that all right, well, Microsoft seems to be interested in small modular reactors, and maybe that'll be part of more and more superscalers' energy strategies going forward um, to get kind of off grid and and potentially I don't know like maybe help make it more palatable politically so they don't have to you know do the same have the same strain on the on the local grid and uh, that certainly seems to be part of the upside here right yeah it's kind of a cool story we'll have nuclear power as we need nuclear power to power ai you yeah. know <laughs> so uh yeah and it's it's actually like not as sci-fi as it might sound there's been a lot of progress in this kind of technology sector. So uh, interesting to see if the hiring will pay off. Last story for this section, Google adds a switch for publishers to opt out of becoming AI training data. That's pretty much the story. So in your robots.txt file, which is what you use to talk to internet crawlers, you can now have this flag to say, don't use my data for Google's AI generative APIs. And I guess this is a big deal in the sense that if Google is doing this, you would hope that everyone would be doing this. And uh, as you've said before, OpenAI also has that option for its search to not have access to things. So um, yeah, if you don't want your data to be used for training and you have a website, now you can uh, specify that. And on to the next section, projects and open source. And we have a couple stories here. First story is Mistral AI makes its first language model free for everyone. This is a French AI startup, and they have released their first language model, Mistral 7B, which it claims outperforms other models of its size. And this is released without any restrictions with the Apache 2.0 license. So we've discussed before how Meta has been open sourcing a lot of models, including Llama 2, which has a 7, 7 billion uh, parameter version. And the claim here is this is another basically comparable 7 billion parameter model that is better and is similarly licensed in a way that businesses can use it without any restrictions. And in fact, it has a more permissive license than Llama 2. So it's Pretty, I mean, given that Llama 2 was already this like big deal of like, wow, this is starting to approach Chat GPT and GPT in terms of what we have uh, in open source models, it, we are still making progress, it seems, pretty rapidly. Yeah, and I guess because they're French, it's technically Mistral 7B. Uh, sorry, guys. Sorry, sorry, French French uh, listeners. Um, je m'excuse. So yeah, th this is actually I think a really big deal uh, on on a number of different levels. So this this company, um, by the way, was co-founded by some DeepMind alums and Meta alums. So really, really like extremely high levels of competence on the team. Um, they raised like over a hundred, uh, over a hundred million. I think it was a couple weeks after they incorporated. Like it's this is the you know the kind of dream team that uh, that builds really powerful stuff. And a couple of uh, for me kind of shocking headlines. This the seven billion parameter model um, outperformed Llama two thirteen billion on all benchmarks. Right. So a model twice as large and very advanced Llama two. Um, 13 billion, it outperforms a model twice its size on, on basically all benchmarks. It outperforms Llama 1 at 34 billion parameters, so like four times its size on a, on many benchmarks, let's say. So this is just like a, a, a really big advance. It comes from, in part, uh, their sliding attention window architecture. It basically allows it to handle longer sequences at kind of smaller cost. Um, it's Conceptually, it's actually fairly simple to understand. You can look at the paper, and they kind of show you how they uh, they set up windows basically to attend to previous tokens in the anyway in the layered architecture. It's sort of hard to describe 
um, verbally, but it's it's a pretty conceptually straightforward thing. They also use this thing called grouped query attention that allows them to accelerate inference. Um, pretty, I, I don't know, I, I, like I was surprised to see this. Um, it, it's generalization abilities are really impressive. They showed that by fine tuning it on an instruction following data set. And um, it's just like, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, Mistral AI is, by the way, notorious for, among other things, um, not having any safety features trained into it, uh, or so this model is. Uh, it's fully available on BitTorrent, so like I can get it to tell me how to hotwire a car, right? And so not that this matters that much, because you look at Llama 2, it theoretically has a bunch of safety measures trained into it, but you can train them out very easily. Um, but still, like we're at the point in the race to the bottom on open source safety, where some companies are literally making zero investment in safety and making models that are on the path to rival things like, as you said, Andre, ChatGPT, GPT 3.5, and maybe even GPT 4. So, you know, when when we think about regulation, I, I think um, this is going to be one of the hot topics. Is like when we have companies that straight up seem willing to open source stuff with effectively no safety measures, at least that's my read of this, um, then, uh, you know, you, you start to worry a little bit about uh, weaponization and other things. Right. So as you said, pretty big deal. Uh, as we've done before, it's worth to caveat that benchmarking and saying this model is better than that model is kind of tricky in this sector. And in particular here, there's no paper. There's a blog post with some details and some graphs. Did they, you know, scrape the data of these benchmarks somehow or, you know, otherwise cheat by accident? It's hard to say. And it is kind of surprising if the 7 billion uh, version is better than the 13 billion version. But it's possible. It's possible that because they don't have these safety protections in there, you get better performance, which is something we know happens. So it is, yeah, pretty dramatic. And I think, in fact, it made me want to highlight a story we skipped that happened a few weeks prior, which is Adept AI Labs open sourcing Persimmon 8B. So there was another model called here 8B, so slightly larger, but kind of basically same class. Another permissively licensed, this is also Apache 2.0, I believe. And they also say this is better than Llama 2 and, and has a larger context size, 16K. So now we have two models in the past month that claim that they outperformed Meta's model and are fully permissibly licensed. Now you have like, you know, yeah, you can basically pick and choose. Do I use Llama? Do I use Persimmon? Do I use Mistral? It's, it's, it's pretty crazy that this is happening so quickly. It, it really is. And, and I guess it, it raises this question of like, at what point does it stop making sense for, uh, you know, really expensive open source training runs to be open sourced? Because like, you know, somebody else is going to compete with you on the same on the same basis within a few weeks, uh, your opportunity to uh, to get clout or value starts to decrease pretty fast. But um, yeah, uh, another another interesting development from Adept AI, which uh, I think, I'm trying to remember, I think they raised, they may have raised more, but my recollection was around 100 million, maybe 60, 65 uh, to date. So they were you know, co-founded by a bunch of DeepMind alums as well. So the, the diaspora of DeepMind and OpenAI and Anthrop, all, all these labs, is really getting to work. And one of the ways we're really starting to feel that now is this open source stuff. Yeah, it's it's quite interesting. Uh, if you do the like timeline and graph <laughs> of <laughs> where these people started, you know, you you have Google, you have maybe maybe Meta, OpenAI, and then it just like is keeps flowering and blowing up. It's crazy. Yeah. And our last story for this section is actually a research paper, but highly relevant, is BTLM-3B-8K, a 7 billion parameter performance in a 3 billion parameter model. So this is coming from Cerebrus, which we have covered in the past as a company that works on AI hardware and works in particular on making efficient hardware. So uh, you use less energy and you kind of use less size perhaps to run your models. And they've been around for a long time, gotten a lot of funding, et cetera. 
And now they have published this research paper and published also this model with the Apache 2.0 license as well, with the main claim being that this is a much smaller model, a 3 billion parameter model that is competitive with 7 billion parameter models. And this matters because basically when you get to that range of 7 billion or 13 billion you need some powerful GPUs like some of the top line NVIDIA ones, A100s at least, and these get pretty expensive if you can buy them uh, or if you pay for a cloud instance, right? That's pretty expensive. So the smaller you get, the cheaper it is, right? And so as a business, you want to go as small as you can. And uh, in that sense, this is a pretty significant story and it's it's different in that now it's not a competition for who can scale up the most. It's in these like parameter size range of you can fit it on one GPU. How good can we make it? And that's just release all of them permissively licensed, apparently. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the so. By the way, uh, in the interest of disclosure, I actually spoke with the founders of Open Tensor, which is the one of the um, companies behind this collaboration. There's Cerebrus and, and Open Tensor, and um, they have this whole thesis around putting AI on the blockchain. It's like it, it actually it's kind of interesting. Um, that that might even be a, a conversation worth linking to from from way back in the day when I was doing just a, a different. Um, a different show. Uh, and um, I think that this is one of those things where every time you hear a headline like this, like, okay, we're getting a 2x lift in efficiency and training efficiency here, right? We're getting from a 3 billion parameter model what we might expect to get from a 7 billion parameter mo model. Uh, these benefits have a way of compounding. So we've just seen a story with Mistral AI um, where they were essentially able to do this as well, right? Get a 2 to 3x lift compared to other comparably sized models. And now we're seeing a, a different approach coming from uh, BitTensor. So if you combine the two, um, depending on the specifics, the chances are pretty good that you actually do get a you know, two times two lift or a four times lift. And you start to compound these with compute improvements. And that's really where like the demand for hardcore processing power can collapse very quickly. And you can get to the point where you're training, like you know, G, like I think we've seen this with GPT three. The, the cost to train a model like that today is uh, is something like one twentieth of what it was back when the model was originally trained. And hardware is also getting better too. So these kind of compounding improvements are part of the exponential trajectory of the technology. And the extent to which they are actually compatible and play nice with each other is like this kind of central question. And one of the challenges is. It's very difficult. Like you got to wait a little bit for people to do the head-to-head -head comparisons, for things to show up on the hugging face leaderboard, and uh, and that's when you can kind of you know get more of an apples to apples. But uh, yeah, really interesting uh, development and uh, uh, focused it seems as well on inference compute. Um, so kind of interesting for edge devices and, and mobile. All right, and moving on to the research and advancements section, starting with any mall, an efficient and scalable any modality augmented language model. So that's the basic assertion there is this is a language model that can take in any modality. This is developed by uh, FAIR and Meta. And we discussed a next GPT in the last episode where the whole idea is kind of like, okay, GPT-4 has images and text. Why can't we just have any modality, right? And this is what the idea here is, is basically as well, right? They introduce any modality augmented language model, any MAL, which is a collection of uh, multi-model encoders trained to transform data from various modalities into the text embedding space. So we've had a, a couple of these other stories in the past. The basic idea is if you train multiple models that take in one kind of data and transform it into some sort of shared data type, across everything, you can then sort of mix and match things. And so, yeah, that's what Meta did here. And they did a bunch of empirical analysis and demonstrations and, and so on. So it's uh, in kind of, we are still in this progression towards multimodality in the research world, I would say, uh, and, and to a lesser extent in things you find out there in uh, industry. 
Yeah, and, and worth flagging, this is all multimodal in the input space, not the output space. And so, you know, this is one of the, the barriers that we still see. Like these models can take in inputs with many modalities and process them um, and generate intelligent outputs, but those outputs are not also multimodal. They're not video, audio, whatever. Um, but yeah, a very meta AI-like strategy, I will say. Like we've seen uh, Yan LeCun, who, uh, who runs uh, AI research there, kind of talk a lot about this idea of a joint, joint embedding space, you know, making sure that the, their AI models are grounded. In other words, that they can like look at many different modes, images, text, audio, and so on, in order to make sure that, yeah, they're, they're grounded in reality in some meaningful sense, which he believes is necessary for human level intelligence. So kind of a, another step along that direction. Next story is Dream Gaussian, generative Gaussian splatting for efficient 3D content creation. And actually alongside that, there was a second paper that came out basically on the same day or like one day apart called Text to 3D using Gaussian splatting. And both of these papers are introducing this notion of Gaussian splatting to do text to 3D generation. So you say, you know, make me a model of a car and it spits out basically a mesh of a car. So far, you know, in the last couple of years, this has been primarily done with neural radiance fields, NERFs. Um, and we've seen a ton of progress in that. And it was like one of the big deal uh, kind of movements in AI research, improving NERF and 3D generation. One of the main uh, issues of NERF is that it's slow. So for a given type of generation, you kind of need to retrain your uh, model and it ends up taking many minutes to generate just one model in the baseline NERF approach. There's been you know, thousands of NERF papers. So there's been other variations. Uh, but they all had the same basic idea in NERF. And so what's interesting here is that they are introducing a kind of just different approach entirely that is not based on optimizing with, uh, like without getting into details, the NERF is based around this notion of optimizing some parameters with the uh, concept of rendering. So it uses ideas from uh, computer graphics, essentially. And this is doing uh, something entirely different. It's doing some geometry optimization and appearance refinement and does it much faster. Uh, so I don't know that, I don't think we want to get into the technical details, but the short story is if you look at the examples, it can do things that are pretty comparable to Nerf 10 times faster. And uh, might be a, yeah, might be a big deal. I am not too familiar with Nerf uh, literature, so it may be the case that there are kinds of Nerfs where this is not a problem. But it's interesting to me that two papers uh, came out about this kind of almost at the same time. Yeah, I, I wonder if this becomes more important as we start to move towards like video and, and not just still kind of 3D or 2D image rendering. Um, you know, obviously compute is the big bottleneck there. You just got to redo the video, sorry, the image generation many times over. So uh, I guess efficiency, kind of a big deal there. Yeah, and, and I think that's why you don't see tools really of text to 3D still online. It's just right. too expensive and too slow. But in a year, year and a mm. half, yeah, you'll have text to 3D. Next up, we have Google DeepMind AI tool assesses DNA mutations for harm potential. This is a paper that came out of DeepMind, a kind of a cool one, um, in keeping with their tradition of kind of targeting down open scientific problems and problems in healthcare and other things like that with their latest models. Uh, they're using AlphaFold and kind of modifying it, training it specifically, fine tuning it to detect specific mutations that could affect the function of human proteins. And specifically, the mutations thereafter are called missense variants. So your and my, hopefully, DNA code um, has you know, essentially four letters that are sometimes referred to, A, T, G, and C. And uh, that's the code that you know, provides for the, 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 the specifies the structure of proteins or the protein sequences, the amino acid sequences that go into making the proteins that make us who we are. And sometimes those letters get messed up uh, just in a kind of freak, you know, kind of mutation or, or, or some, some incident happens. And then they end up coding for nonsensical proteins that 
really can't function. If that happens, or sorry, if they end up coding for things that can't even be proteins. If that happens, you have a nonsense mutation. But if it codes for something that can be a protein that turns out to actually be really dangerous, then that is a missense variant or potentially dangerous. So it's like, it's a protein, but it could do bad things, or it's, it's a protein that's kind of messed up. That's a mis missense variant. Uh, genetic mutation. And essentially, they, they put together this giant catalog of all of these missense mutations um, using what they're calling alpha missense, which is this sort of like, uh, it seems to be a fine tuned version of alpha fold. And uh, they categorize something like 89% of all 71 million possible missense variants as either likely pathogenic or likely benign. Until now, Instead of, forget about 89%, only 0.1% had been confirmed by human experts. So this is again like AlphaFold, where humans had only mapped the structures of like a tiny fraction of possible proteins, and then AlphaFold comes in and just blows that wide open. This is happening again. So when you think about you know, proteomics, when you think about, um, uh, what do they call it now, functional, computational um computational genomics or no computational i don't know there's like a field this is going to be built big for whatever field whose name i just forgot right now um so very cool uh big development from deepmind yeah it's very cool to see deepmind continuing to push in these directions i think alpha fold is not something that is a big revenue generator <laughs> right <laughs> but is something that deepmind uniquely is doing we don't see open ai on Fropic or anyone else doing it uh and it is you know, a huge impact for science. So kudos on keeping on for that direction. And now onto our lightning round, we have a post from Anthropic called Prompt Engineering for Claude's Long Context Window. So Claude, um, if, you're, if you're following this, they have the longest context window in the game right now, like 100,000 or so tokens. So really gigantic. And so they're, they're starting to ask the question, okay, like how can we make the best use of this? You know, how can we... Um, prompt our system in order to get really good and reliable outputs from it. And this is a blog post about best practices on exactly that. There, there are a bunch of things highlighted in it, and I won't go into to detail here, but the one thing that really stood out to me was they tested um, putting a, um, essentially putting queries or putting important information at different points in a very long document to see how well their model could recall those points when prompted. And what they found was if you put the information towards the beginning of the document, it's much less likely to be recalled on the order, like, say, it looks like 70% or so from their various tests. It's much less likely, about 70% likely to be recalled. Um, whereas if you put it at the end, you're more like 90% likely to recall that information or the model is. So it's sort of interesting because it reveals a, a very strong dependence on the location in your prompt in which you place the information that you want to query out of the, uh, the document. So you upload a document in your prompt, and at the bottom of the prompt, you ask a question about the document. Depending on where the relevant information is, you'll have varying degrees of success. I, I found that quite interesting, and, and maybe I just haven't thought hard enough about it, but that, uh, that struck me as a little bit surprising. Right. Yeah. And it, it goes to a point of like the post is titled Prompt Engineering, and, and that really is like, how do you write a prompt that works well with long context windows? You don't really yeah. know, and, and now you might be learning some things. And last story for the section, not research, but just on potential advancement. John Carmack and Rich Sutton partnered to accelerate development of AGI. So John Carmack, founder of Keen Technologies, famous technologist, kind of broadly speaking. He has worked on VR and on computer graphics. And Dr. Richard Sutton, uh, who is now a chief scientific advisor at AMI, but also a very big figure in AI, having worked on reinforcement learning have now apparently partnered to develop AGI. And that's the extent of the story. There's not too much clarity on what it implies or, or how much work they'll put into it besides their actual main businesses. But uh, I guess as far as partnerships go, this one is kind of cool. Yeah, and, and if you so these are by the way as a partnership with two very eccentric people. Um, so John Carmack is famous for having defined basically the first person shooter genre. So he made Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, and and a, a bunch of other games back in the in, in the day. Um, very very intelligent guy, very eccentric thinker on AI. Definitely an accelerationist. 
Rich Sutton, also very eccentric, uh, famous for inventing reinforcement learning, basically, and also writing a blog post called The Bitter Lesson, which was the first place that anybody really kind of articulated, uh, at least very publicly, the idea of AI scaling, that that might just be the only thing that we need. And he recently, by the way, went to China to basically say, hey, uh, we should welcome our new robot overlords and engage in what he referred to as succession planning to gradually hand off our agency to machines. So definitely uh, two big time accelerationists teaming up on this. Um, not very well funded. Um, so they, uh, John Carmack's company, Keen Technologies, this AGI company, they've only raised $20 million, though the investors are very, very high quality. You know, Daniel Gross of uh, Y Combinator, Patrick, uh, formerly Y Combinator, Patrick Car uh, Collinson of um, Stripe, Toby Lutke, Shopify, and, and so on. So really Im impressive uh, investors, but that's not much money. And if you believe in scaling, which we know Rich Sutton does, that is not nearly enough money to make you competitive. So it'll be interesting to see what their strategy ends up being. And moving on to policy and safety. Our first story is a top GOP senator teams up with key Democrat on light touch AI bill. So Senate Minority Whip John Fuhn, the Republican, is teaming up with Senator Amy Klobuchar to introduce this uh, so-called light touch AI bill that sets guidelines for AI system. It seems to have already gained uh, some backers, like IBM's AI policy executives. At a high level, it would task the uh, Commerce Department with enforcement of these AI guidelines and companies develop or deploying AI systems would be responsible for assessing their impact and certifying their safety. So yeah, it seems like as far as uh, you know, progress towards regulation in AI in the US, this being a bipartisan effort that is, let's say, not very extreme, it's light touch, might be a significant step towards getting this AI regulation done. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's interesting because I'm uh, uh, I, like I'm personally concerned about this approach. Um, I think that uh, the light touch, by the way, works great for a lot of levels of the stack. Like if you're training models with like uh, you know GPT four levels of compute and below, or GPT three levels of compute and below, certainly like totally cool and light touch makes sense. But um, uh, you know, if to the extent that we buy into the the premise, which basically all frontier labs unanimously do at this point, that AI is on track to become a WMD like and WMD enabling technology in the near future, uh, you need very very stringent uh, security and and regulatory and legislative measures. So um, I think that like is a really important carve out here. You know, it doesn't mean that you have to be heavy handed on the whole. But it's important to recognize, you know, if this belongs to the equivalence class of technologies that you know weaponizable uranium does, then we ought to treat it as such. Um, so, in that sense, I'm actually a little concerned about the partisan framing here because one of the things that was explicitly said was there's concern over what Senator Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer might ultimately endorse, framing his approach, his presumed approach, as heavy-handed. And I'm, I'm a little worried about that. Like, look, I'm personally, I'm kind of a free market libertarian, but I think when you're talking about things like WMDs, like you, you gotta, you just can't treat that the same way. And, uh, and it is, it is worrying to hear this kind of tone that like, there's some sort of, you know, we don't yet know what Chuck Schumer is going to propose. And, um, and I think being open to the idea that yes, like, Light touch makes sense for some things, but for others, like we just we just got to treat this seriously uh, if we're going to heed the again pretty unanimous calls that we're hearing from uh, from not just the frontier labs, but if you talk to folks in AI safety who understand the kind of weaponization uh, space, let alone the rogue AI risk, um, it kind of comes into focus. So I'm going to be watching this one really closely personally, just because that's so close to uh, to my area of work. But um, it is it is interesting, and we'll see. Oh, and and one last thing is kind of funny. This is. Uh, Senate Minority Whip John Thune, who's saying this, and since the Senate minor Minority Whip is asking us to chill out on this, I guess we could call him a cool whip. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so it is worth noting that it is the Republican here calling this a light touch bill. Yep. Uh, so I think the emphasis there is partially to kind of get to backing of Republicans who don't like regulation, of course. Um, but yeah, we'll see. It, it appears that Amy Klobuchar says that 
you know, we just need it right away so we can't delay it on negotiation and getting Republicans on the board. Uh, and it sounds like this will actually be introduced either this week or next week. So soon yeah. it might go to a vote. Uh, so they are, yeah, they are also calling for self certification on the part of companies, which uh, yeah, <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> Uh, next story, AI facial recognition tech leads to wave of lawsuits from black plaintiffs after mistaken identities and in arrest. So this is a story from Fortune that doesn't cover uh, primarily anything too new. Uh, there was a new lawsuit filed in Atlanta last month, uh, in uh, September 8th. That lawsuit names some detectives who used uh, surveillance video and uh, facial recognition to basically issue an arrest warrant. And it was kind of the only real evidence, it seems. And it could have been easily shown that uh, the uh, person arrested, uh, Randall Koran Reed, could not have been doing this. And so this article kind of goes through that story and also covers the uh, background of in recent years, going back to 2022 and 2021, this has happened multiple times. So there are now at least five cases of black plaintiffs who have filed lawsuits against law enforcement in various cities because they have been arrested based on uh, facial recognition results and and little else. And, and really, it would have been easily disproven where facial recognition was the only evidence. So yeah, another case of this, you know, police departments not utilizing technology well and the facial recognition leading to issues. And another case where clearly we need, I don't know if you need regulation or what, but we need to avoid this kind of outcome for sure. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's interesting, a, a situation where the technology kind of gets ahead. And, you know, we, we usually rely on lawsuits to correct these sorts of problems over time. But one of the challenges with AI is it like, just moves so fast that entire new use cases are created. You know, the, the damage can be done in some cases, and then you kind of, you know, move on to the next use case that gets created. And it's difficult for the the laws and, and regulations and so on to catch up. So, uh, yeah, and, and, and not the first time that we've seen a story like this, too. Eh? It's it's um, unfortunately seems seems pretty common. On to the lightning round. First, we have California Governor Vito's bill banning robot trucks without safety drivers. So that's a story. California Governor Gavin Newsom has vetoed this bill that we covered, I think, earlier that would have banned heavy-duty driverless trucks from operating in California without a human driver. I was a bit surprised by the bill in the first place, given that robot trucks are a very safe seemingly use of self-driving technology, you know, going across distant cities on lonely highways. So yeah, now I guess California will have robot trucks, maybe. Yeah. Kind of surprising to see Gavin Newsom, like as surprising as it is to hear about the bill, it's surprising also to hear Gavin Newsom um, maybe take this position. It does seem to be the reasonable position, but um, he's historically been very kind of uh, pro regulation, pro oversight, and uh, I, th I think this is a good move. This this seems to make sense. Yeah, it is worth noting that this bill was backed by labor, I guess, which makes sense, and was passed with a heavy majority in both houses of the Senate legislature. So this oh, bill might still be overturned uh, with a two thirds uh, majority, but uh, yeah, I guess didn't expect this to be a contentious issue, and it's it's interesting to see this happening. Next story, more on the concerned front. Fake naked pictures of young girls created with AI spark fury in a small Spanish town. So this is kind of crazy. Yeah, as the title said, there were images of over 20 girls aged 11 to 17, of whom images were generated using this AI app called Cloth Off. Uh, in the small Spanish town. So presumably some resident of a town decided to start doing this. And now the Spanish National Police Force is investigating. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, we've had deep uh, fakes uh, for porn for a long time. It has been one of the main kind of negative 
worrying aspects of it and it's still very much the case and in fact it's getting worse because it's getting much easier to do this uh, and yeah this is just another example of like <laughs> these things are happening yeah i mean if anything is going to lead to legislation something like this uh <laughs> very likely will it's not a good headline yeah and up next, we have AI Security Center to open at National Security Agency, which is the NSA. Um, this is a new entity. It's a pretty quick story. A new entity that just uh, oversees the development and the integration of AI into U.S. national security systems. Um, it's going to be kind of a, a focal point, a center of expertise for best practices and like kind of evals, figuring out risk frameworks, that sort of thing. The idea is that they'll work with folks in industry uh, national labs, academia, and the uh, the IC, like the intelligence community, um, and select foreign partners. So it's going to be a consolidation point for just a lot of what's been going on anyway in the DoD. Um, I thought that the, the one quote of interest uh, was that the uh, the general founding the um, the center just said AI security is about protecting AI systems from learning, doing, and revealing the wrong thing, which interestingly, by this definition, makes AI security incorporate things like AI alignment and solving the control problem, which you know, when you think about DoD um, is, is a kind of good thing for them to be focused on. Uh, they do actually have a really great culture of uh, kind of being safety-minded and conservative, uh, especially on AI. They have a lot of regulations internally about this stuff and just like the mentality when you talk to people there and when they're working on AI, it is very much with a risk-focused lens. Um, I think a lot more so than uh, people in tech tend to realize. So I think this is kind of cool. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what the impact is on the overall AI strategy within DoD. And on to the next story, actually similar in a way, uh, this story is we can prevent AI disaster like we prevented nuclear catastrophe. And the short version is there is the International Atomic Energy Agency, which has been used to uh, deal with nuclear weapons and try to coordinate an international kind of policy and, and set of uh, behaviors to avoid nuclear catastrophe. And now there is the proposed institution for the multilateral AI consortium called uh, MAGIC, which would basically sort of do a similar thing. Uh, it would do safety first research and really exclusively focus on high risk AGI outcomes. It, uh, yeah, so this is now being discussed in various circles uh, by some officials. And it does seem like a very real possibility that this kind of uh, you know, international organization might be established. Yeah, I think... Um... I think it's fair to say there is a lot of interest for this sort of solution. Um, notably, the article is by Andrea Miotti, who is the head of governance at Conjecture. Uh, Conjecture uh, has a very interesting um, kind of backstory where their uh, founder, um, uh, Connor Leahy, was the guy who originally replicated GPT-2. And um, uh, anyway, they, they have this, this interesting thesis around, um, uh, around AI safety that's very pessimistic. And so they start to look at um, policy as the main way to prevent uh, what they think is technically kind of very difficult to prevent. Um, in other words, the loss of control over AI systems. So that's kind of the focus here. Uh, and yeah, I think it's interesting. I think one of the big challenges with this sort of structure is anytime you have a multilateral consortium, you have to bring together adversaries. Um, and if you're going to do that, there's going to be a lot of spying. So if you're doing AI safety research and advanced AI R and D, like that's one of the big kind of open questions is how do you, yeah, how do you control that? Like the uh, CERN model, the IAEA model in the past have had sort of, um, let's say, related problems, and uh, yeah, so it'll be interesting to see if uh, if that persists here. And uh, just to be clear, so I don't mislead anyone, the uh, magic Multilateral AGI consortium is just 
in this article. I don't think it's currently being yeah, it's advocated. A yeah. It's a proposal, but the general idea has been discussed by various people. On to our last section, synthetic media and art. The first story is Hollywood's deal with screenwriters just rewrote the rules around AI. And yeah, so this is highlighting, I think maybe we discussed this already, this tentative deal with Hollywood studios regarding the use of AI in writing that is a pretty big deal. So this agreement states that AI cannot be considered a writer. And although studios can use AI to generate a first draft, the credited writers who received uh, the draft to humans will get the credit and the minimum pay. And I think for somewhat you know technical reasons, not crediting an AI actually matters a lot for who gets money, <laughs> essentially. Uh, and studios also cannot require guild members to use AI, and writers can choose to use AI in their own uh, on their own if a studio allows it. So it's it's a pretty big win uh, from kind of the writer artist perspective, and uh, it seems like might influence the other strikes that are currently going on, especially with actors that still haven't settled with uh, the Hollywood studios. Yeah. Um, a long awaited, um, a long awaited kind of conclusion to the saga. Um, sorry, no, no pun intended there. The saga. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Screen Actors Guild. Award. Um, Screen, Screen, Screen Actors Guild. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, precedent setting, and I, I think uh, interesting that that this domain is the one where we felt this first. I'm curious what this does also to just the the demand for labor, because yes, uh, we're not replacing human writers, but um, anyway, uh, we might be. Uh, making them far more efficient, and that might lead to less employment opportunities. And on to our second main story, Indian actor Anil Kapoor wins court battle over AI use of his likeness. So Anil Kapoor is a major Indian actor, and he won a court battle in New Delhi over an authorized use of his likeness. Apparently, the court ordered 16 defendants to be restrained from using his name, image, voice, or any aspect of his persona for monetary gain. And it seems like it would yeah, set a precedent for similar uses of AI uh, for impersonating people, essentially. Yeah, it looks like it's it's his likeness and and his catchphrase, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce. But it's it looks like jakas or something like that. Please, mm. uh, please do correct uh, correct me, uh, South Asian uh, listeners. But yeah, I mean it's uh, it's another example, I guess, of of a trend we've seen. And finally, we're we're getting to the point where I feel like the impact of the legal proceedings is pro- is probably starting to affect how companies. Are actually going to operate, so that's that's you know sort of a, a positive here. Yeah, and incidentally, it just so so happened that uh, earlier this week there was another story of Tom Hanks Warren's dental plan ad image is AI fake. <laughs> so yeah, there was like apparently a deep fake where someone used Tom Hanks image to I don't know make an ad for some dental products and clearly you know we are probably going to be completely flooded with this sort of thing soon right so it's essential really that we have some legal you know understanding around these situations and obviously random celebrities would not want ads to just be created randomly with their likeness so i guess it's just a matter of time until in the us it will be made very clear that you cannot uh, do this sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, unless we want the internet to turn into a bunch of Tom Hanks deepfakes for dental plan ads, which does not sound like the worst possible outcome. but Not the worst, but you know, <laughs> maybe not the best. <laughs> <laughs> and on to the lightning round with a few more stories. First... Amazon restricts offers from self-publishing more than three books a day after AI concerns. So that's pretty much the story. Last week, we covered about how Amazon allowed you to tag your work with the fact that it was using AI. Now they have this rule. So I'm guessing that 
you know, it's a real issue that's already started to happen on Amazon of just being flooded with AI books. I mean, who are these lightweights who are publishing less than three books a day on Amazon? That's what I want to know. Like, come on, like, get up early, you know? That's uh, I know. Really disappointing. Yeah, no, it's interesting to see a, a volume cut off like this too, because it's like, I don't know, what... Um, how did they get to three books a day? Like that's, that's just seems very high. I, I guess maybe uh, authors could, could be more like publishing companies in their eyes. Is that possible? Or, or is this literally like individual authors? Yeah, that's a good question. Cause I kind of feel like for individual authors, if you're publishing more than like, I don't know, a, like a book a month seems extraordinarily like excruciatingly high. It's a, yeah, so this is a rule on the number that authors can self-publish. So I think this would not have any effect on publishers. Uh, also, interestingly, they have said in a statement that they have not seen a spike in their publishing numbers, but this is being instituted to protect against abuse and they're lowering volume limits. So... Probably there was a volume limit of some sort, uh, but it seems like, uh, yes, there was also some commentary in this article that this seems like it would not be a game changer for managing the influx of AI. You know, it, it will maybe <clears throat> limit absurd spamming, but it it's kind of just a safeguard against truly ridiculous stuff and there'll still be a big problem with ai generated fluff so to speak on amazon up next we have project gutenberg has implemented one of the wor one of the worst ai fears of striking actors so this is all in the context of the screen screen actors guild sag that uh, that are on strike right now and they're asking for various protections actually there, so there's a an agreement that, that's tabled at the moment um, that seems like it might have legs to kind of, um, uh, anyway, to, to resolve that strike, I believe. Um, but yeah, Project Gutenberg has been using AI to transform thousands of eBooks into audiobooks, totally bypassing the need for human readers. And uh, yeah, these audiobooks are now in a whole bunch of different uh, platforms. They're read in apparently a naturalistic male voice. And so, uh, you know, all the all the implications you can imagine about you know people basically being automated out of out of work. I will say. Having, uh, I was going to say having written, having read an audiobook, um, these things are really time consuming to produce. And you can totally imagine the cost incentive for a lot of publishing houses to like just go with a strategy like this. So I think the way we deal with this now is probably going to need to set the precedent going forward because the economic incentive is going to be very significant. Right. And uh, it is, of course, worth noting that this is. That's maybe a special case, right? It's not a commercial offering. These are free books. Uh, and so it yeah. doesn't seem like it would have been an option to pay professional voice actors to do this narration. Uh, interestingly, they actually published a report on this earlier in the month, large-scale automatic audiobook creation. And this was done in collaboration with Microsoft, MIT, and Google. So it's yeah almost partially a research project uh it's it's all open license they have released the code as well um yeah it clearly does interact with the the worry of ai voice actors if uh, of, of voice actors if you can do all these books even you can do new books that aren't free but at the same time as you said i think the benefits of this are too great in, in this case and in many other cases. And then on to the next story, Meta's AI stickers are here and already causing controversy. So we covered the slate of new AI features in uh, Meta's products in the beginning of this podcast, and now we're getting to some of the consequences. So you can now generate stickers in kind of the yeah, simple text to image uh, notion. And there's been a lot of examples of people doing, you know, inappropriate things as you might've expected. Like yeah, you exactly. can make 
a sticker of uh, Waluigi, the Mario character, holding a rifle. Uh, you can make uh, child soldiers. You can make uh, all sorts of things. There's some funny examples here. Trudeau buttocks was, was used in one of these, I believe. Yes, Karl Marx large breasts. I mean, I don't think that one is, is that bad, let's say, but certainly does show what you could do. Um, so, yeah, that is kind of surprising honestly like i would have thought it would have been better at detecting things it shouldn't do like child soldier for instance or or any copyrighted stuff like waluigi um so it's quite uh i guess amusing to be honest but uh, also is worrying in the case of if they are so bad at you know safely releasing ai for users to essentially abuse in this case then clearly you know in other cases this could actually be kind of harmful yeah yeah totally i mean this is the move fast and break things philosophy that zuck is specifically famous for um and like yeah to see it <laughs> to see it lead to a rollout like this that like literally exposes meta to I have to imagine like legal risk here in various ways, but those would include copyright, presumably. Um, is like like whoa, that's you know your uh, your own self interest directly like contradicts this, and yet you're still still deploying um, this uh, the system. Kind of kind of remarkable, yeah. Uh, in response to some of the you know conversation around this, it does look like Meta has a blog post titled Building Generative AI Features Responsibly on their blog that uh, goes into, I guess, how they intend to responsibly release these things, building safeguards, and a little bit hedging. Uh, so it says, as with all generative AI systems, these models could return accurate or inappropriate outputs, blah, blah, blah. So... Yeah, it, uh, clearly they would want and are working on safeguards, but it seems like they maybe haven't done enough with these new release features. Next, we have Franson Grisham and other prominent authors sue OpenAI. And um, so this is like, I want to say yet another lawsuit, more than a dozen authors filing a lawsuit here uh, against OpenAI, accusing the company of infringing on their copyrights by using their books to train as ChatGPT chatbot. Um, so right now, I, I was trying to follow this and like, I was perusing over the stories, Andre, that we've been covering on this general intersection of like chat GPT and like lawsuits. And it seems like there are sort of four clusters. There's the open AI um, getting sued for copyright, which this falls into. There is open AI um, suing other people for like copyright infringement. Um, there's people suing open AI because it's chatbot um, uh, libeled them or, or allegedly libeled them. And um, then there's people suing OpenAI for, uh, what was the last thing? Uh, crap. I can't exactly remember. Anyway, those are three of the, the, the big clusters that we've seen. And it's just like, it's interesting to see the kind of, again, the pressure is starting to form. And there are a bunch of these lawsuits, like lawsuits like this one, specifically about copyright infringement. We've covered them. Um, this is distinct from some of the others. Uh, what one was, by the way, Sarah Silverman was uh, kind of leading that one. This one has a bunch of other famous people, uh, which I think is going to probably be an important factor here. Uh, one of them is, um, oh shoot, where was the list? Anyway, one of them was Jody Piku, who is like this famous. Uh, best-selling author and um, uh, Pulitzer Prize winners like Michael Chabon here and, and other folks. So very kind of heavy hitting lawsuit. And I'm super curious what the outcome is going to be. You know, the question hinges on what you think ChatGPT is actually doing, what the legal system thinks ChatGPT is actually doing, and whether, you know, learning from something is intrinsically an act of copyright infringement, how similar generated text has to be in order for it to be to infringe on the copyright, and maybe even whether the potential infringement, the potential generation of verbatim copyright infringing text uh, would be you know a, a thing here. Because you got to figure, like we've had enough papers written on how you just cannot predict or control the outputs of an AI system, you couldn't really guarantee that ChatGPT will not 
uh, generate you know verbatim outputs. I guess you could in various ways. But anyway, that's all I think interesting dimensions to this. I'm not a lawyer, but seems like a very interesting and thorny legal problem. Exactly. Yeah, this whole notion of and this has already been you know discussed a lot in the context of text to image, where in a way it's much more intuitive, right? If you say generate me an image in the style of Picasso, and then it clearly has seen the works of Picasso because it knows his style. Now, is that copyright infringement? I guess Picasso might be you know open public, but there's many cases of entirely copyrighted artists still working today yeah. whose uh, style you can replicate, right? So that's um, clearly a pretty significant question that has no obvious answer, is that copyright infringement? And here with text, it's a little less obvious, but you can, you can say, write me a fantasy novel in the style of George R. R. Martin, right? Right. So in a way, it's it's very similar. And as you said, there's quite a few ongoing uh, lawsuits There's actually Another uh, article called OpenAI and ChatGPT Lawsuit List, which has all of them listed. I think there's 10 that it uh, goes over, and a few of them uh, are this uh, copyright category. And uh, I think this latest one might be the most serious one yet, given that it is coming from the Offers Guild and 17 other offers. And then, uh, you know, they request that. Uh, OpenAI stop using their work and also basically give them damages for profits made uh, for using their work without uh, permission. So very much an ongoing story. I don't know. We might probably see more of these uh, kinds of lawsuits and uh, it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out. Yep. And I will say Jody Piku, one of the um, folks suing in this kind of latest, most high profile one, um, kind enough to uh, to blurb my book. So available in fine bookstores, blurbed by, there you uh, go. by somebody who's suing OpenAI. So I, I, I <laughs> swore I would never become part of the story, but here I am reluctantly telling you guys this. So here you are. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, we are done with this episode. Thank you so much for listening to Last Week in AI. Once again, you can find the articles we discussed here today and subscribe to the weekly newsletter with similar ones at lastweekin.ai. You can email us at contact at lastweekin.ai or comment on YouTube or Substack or I don't know, Spotify, wherever you want, and we'll try and keep an eye out. Of course, we would appreciate if you share the podcast, if you rate it, all the stars, uh, if you sing your praises about it on social media, all of that. But uh, really, we mostly care that you do listen, so be sure to keep tuning in. And me and Jeremy will be posting Back. again, <laughs> I think, yeah. going forward. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs>